camera is going to stay on. All right, so that's that's good. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for the introduction. Um, so this is going to be um, probably some of your familiar uh, theme, which is the uh, vibrational theory of olfaction. Um, I'll explain what the words mean in, in a moment. The most olfaction just means smell. OK, so um, what's the starting point? Um, well, on the left clearly is a dog, uh, and um, it's there for a very good reason. Uh, we associate with them a, a, a very good sense of smell. Um, now, we, we also have a, a good sense of smell. Dogs just happen to be even better, and it's a quite a sense in the following sense that um, it's selective by which I mean I can distinguish quite easily between quite different um, odors. Uh, coffee smells different from an orange, for example. Uh, it's quite sensitive. In other words, you can detect really low levels of certain compounds, parts per billion and things like that. Uh, it's what I was calling wide spectrum. What I mean by that is the range of things we can smell is quite wide and it's low power. Um, and the complex analytical equipment was a reference to the fact that uh, you, you can detect the smell and assign meaning to it and that's true for dogs and for us in other words when you smell coffee you you're, you know what that means um and i'll go through the biology for a bit and then for reasons i hope will become clear i'll switch over to uh nanotechnology there's, there's a, a clear link between the two but i think i'll wait until i get that point for explaining what that's all about okay so that's that's sort of the the scene um so the way i'm going to divide this talk is uh first uh a description of how humans smell or what we know about that and then I'll switch as it says from here from biology to technology and the reason I say I'll, I'll explain at that point. So first what's going on when we smell something so uh, this helpful figure from Wikipedia um, kind of says quite a lot so uh, it's a cut through obviously of a, a head a human head and you imagine inhaling some air, like so that the air travels up through your, your nose, uh, shown on the left, and then it goes underneath um, the uh, nasal epithelium. There's a piece of the brain just behind the skull at the top at the back of the nose uh, where the air flows past. And then this, let's move to the uh, this diagram here, this uh, expanded diagram here. And the bit I'm really interested in is right at the bottom of this diagram, you see these little dendrites down here. And those contain receptors, and those can then pick up um, small molecules that are brought in when you inhale. And then uh, they can be detected and pro the signals processed. So that's the bit I'm after. There's an awful lot of stuff going on there, but the bit really, the only bit I'm going to talk about today are these dendrites at the bottom which have these little receptors in which uh, the question is how do those receptors identify molecules of a particular type and that's what the discussion is about so um, there are kind of two competing views and they're not really entirely distinct that there's quite a lot of overlap i think really but um, the conventional view is that they the, the receptors in our nose operate a bit like enzymes or something uh, so that the uh, receptors have some kind of shape and some uh, molecular groups with charges and, and so on, uh, which allows molecules that arrive to bind or to not bind, and then the uh, receptor identifies uh, those molecules to, by uh, responding to the degree to which the, the, the odorant binds. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, there are some difficulties with that view. Um, so a different view was put, put out actually a long time ago. I've named, noted three people here, Dyson, Wright and Turin. Um, three people who promoted this alternative view, which is that um, we detect not so much the shape, but the vibrational frequencies of the molecule. And the problem up until 1996 was how was that possible? Uh, it's really not obvious how you would do that inside a molecule. Uh, but Luca Turin suggested that actually it's achieved through uh, inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy, something that's been known in solid state physics for a while. And he came up with a possible uh, mechanism by which that would occur. So let me just take you through a little bit more about 
the receptors and, and what, what, how people picture what's going on. So on the left is probably actually an enzyme or something, but it, this is the, uh, I'm trying to explain here what I mean by molecules having the right shape and, 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 and bonding and so on. So you have a cartoon at the top, you have uh, the hexagon and the rectangle, uh, which are a molecule which then bind into the pocket shown underneath and on the right is a, is a more detailed atomistic uh, image of what's going on. And once it binds, then you can see that the right hand picture changes shape a bit so that those molecules, when they, they arrive and they dock inside the receptor, that causes the receptor actually to change shape and that's how you create a signal. Uh, on the right hand side is something that's more specific to um, olfaction or closer to being specific to olfaction, um, uh, but based on this picture. Um, so you have uh, the receptors in, in olfaction are so-called uh, G-protein coupled receptors, and they're characterized by having seven uh, proteins that cross the membrane of, of a cell, transmembrane proteins. And on the left, you have the top left, you have the so-called inactive site. So that's this, this area here, you have this inactive site. And then uh, a molecule arrives and binds in there, and then that causes the uh, collection of proteins to change that arrangement, and that then uh, causes a signal to be generated. And here we're looking in the, in the lower part of the diagram, we're looking from above. And so you have these areas here highlighted in gray, which are kind of the places where binding can occur. And then the molecule arrives and binds, and that causes the uh, proteins to rearrange themselves and then again that's how you create your signal so that's that's the view that is probably still the most popular uh, and has been held for a while but uh, as I said it's not without its problems um, and uh, Charles Sell in 2006 wrote a paper explaining uh, what the problem is um, so if you look at these molecules you see that underneath them there's a number uh, but more importantly, there's a label which tells you the kind of smell that it has. So if you look at the top left here, we see these ones described as fruity. And these ones down below here are described as being camphoraceous. And all six on the right here have, a, a, well, they're called musk, that musk, except for one which says Uranus. But um, the point of these is, these, those, even with these very simple diagrams, you can see they have a really very different shape. And it's not obvious how they would have the same smell if you were just going to look at the shapes. Um, so this is this is uh, a good question, and how, how is this possible? So we'll just leave that hanging as a question for the moment. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at another piece of, of work where um, uh, the group of Mitchell took a, a new set of molecules, this shown, shown here, and there are actually seven uh, different kinds of odor represented here, although that is not indicated on the diagram. Um, and what they did is they, for each molecule, they created a, uh, a fingerprint made uh, derived from the vibrational spectrum. And they then used that to cluster the molecules uh, to sort of see which molecules are similar to which other molecules. And then they found that those that are most similar to each other based on the vibrational spectrum were also similar in terms of odor. So let's go through the data here. So on the left, you have um, a measure of the distance between molecules based on the vibrational spectrum. And um, the higher the uh, bars are relative to each other, the more distant they are. So the bars on the left here are all very similar. Then uh, if you compare that with something over here, you see there's a huge distance between these two different groups. But these groups are similar to each other and so on. That's how you read this diagram. And by comparison on the right, there's something that uses traditional uh, descriptors based on uh, shapes and molecules and other factors. And you can see that they really don't form clusters. They're really quite different from each other. And uh, that's step one. And then step two, if you then look at these clusters that, that they gathered the molecules into 10 clusters and ask what's the odor associated with each molecule, you'll find that cluster one is all nine. Uh, uh, have the ambergris type smell and cluster two and three and four uh, have bitter almond etc so you find that this clustering actually is also a way of identifying uh, at least broadly what the the odor is of the molecule so this suggests there's some correlation between vibrational spectrum and and odor which appears to be lacking from the other descriptors that we had 
So this is evidence that supports that vibrational uh, spectrum matter. So that, that's uh, statistics. How about mechanisms? Um, and here's a cartoon in which I try to describe um, the mechanism. Um, and you have an electron that jumps from, uh, this is the Turing mechanism, basically you have your pocket here, if the site with the electron begins, the donor site, you have a site where the electron ends at the acceptor site and you have the molecule in between. And this diagram in the middle is trying to explain what the dynamics are that's going on. So you start with an electron in this state here at the top, which is the donor state, and it moves over to the acceptor state, which is currently empty. So after the transition, it ends up down here in the acceptor state. And in the middle, as there's a measure of the vibrational state of M, and it starts, let's say, in the ground state, and as the electron passes by, it gets excited. And if the change in energy due to the uh, increase in vibration is exactly offset by the change in energy due to the, the electron dropping down energy, then the energy of the system remains the same and you have a, a resonant transition and therefore a high high rate of, of transition from D to A. In other words, if your um, the vibrational modes of your molecule match the energy difference between your donor acceptor states, then you know that you have a molecule, a current can flow and therefore you know you have a molecule uh, in your receptor with that vibrational frequency. So we now have a mechanism by which to um, measure frequency inside uh, a biological system. That's that's the idea. And on the right hand side is, is a cartoon of how you might make such a thing in the lab, but I won't talk about that now. Um, OK, so that was all looking good. And then somebody wrote, or not somebody, a, a large team wrote a really formidable paper. Um, a huge amount of work went into this. Uh, entitled the implausibility of the vibrational theory of olfaction so you, you get the idea from from the title that they don't approve and let me explain a little bit about what the the structure of the paper was um there's two parts to it both both very important um they have a theoretical part and an experimental part and the theory identified problems with the theory that i've been working on which is the need for a very quiet background basically Actually, that was something that we knew. It wasn't, in a sense, news, but they did highlight this this difficulty. Um, the experiments uh, were uh, really sophisticated ones, where they took receptors and uh, were able to measure the uh, iron flow from the receptors when they added uh, different molecules. They they chose two things to be the odorants cyclopentadecanone and muscone, and then they use two versions, one with hydrogen atoms and one with a number of the hydrogens replaced by deuterium. And the idea there is by deuterating them, you don't change the shape, uh, but you do change the vibrational spectrum. And they found very little difference in the response of receptors to those uh, between the deuterated and the undeuterated, from which they concluded that um, the vibrational spectrum wasn't wasn't what's driving the detection. And therefore, they concluded that the vibrational theory is implausible. So it's quite a tight logic. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, and the answer is, it's it's really difficult to progress from here because the biological, biological experiments are so difficult and it's, um, it's not something I can do anyway. So I've really switched my attention to uh, the nanotechnology side, the idea being that if we can make something that operates using the Turin mechanism, um, in the lab under control conditions, then maybe that gives us some insight into the uh, biology as well as um, uh, allowing us to create new, new and interesting sensors. So this, I'll go very quickly through this, but this is just the original in, in elastic electron tunneling spectroscopy experiment by Lam and Jaklovich, where you have two metal plates and an insulator, and you get uh, inelastic tunneling uh, once you change the voltage enough to allow the inelastic channel to open up. So when an electron starts on the left, loses energy to a vibration in a molecule in the insulator and emerges on the right, you can get an extra channel increase and increase in current. And that's what the pitch on the right is trying to show. The trouble with that experiment has to be done under very at very low temperatures, and that clearly doesn't apply uh, to us. So we need some refinement of that. Uh, this is just, uh, there was another problem with that, which is that the molecule detecting had to be embedded in the oxide. This is an experiment from 2008 uh, where they allowed actually the molecule to diffuse into that intermediate region, but they did it at room temperature. They got a signal, but the resolution is very, very poor. 
um, which is all that's saying. So I'm basically I'm really emphasizing the need to do something to deal with temperature. So this is the basic idea of when you go into the lab, how do you make something that could operate at room temperature and therefore emulate what happens in, in nature? Um, and the idea is the following. You have your two metal electrodes, which I'm showing here left and right, but they, they are then attached electronically uh, to sharp levels. And those sharp levels pin the energies of the electrons. And then you can sweep those levels past each other and vary the, the gap between them. And then that sets a very sharp energy uh, window uh, for measuring vibrational frequencies. So as you vary the voltage, you start with a, with a gap and therefore the current is small. So the diagram on the right is showing how the current varies you sweep the voltage. And you get to a certain voltage where the two levels are on resonance, you get a sharp peak. And then you keep going and then they go off resonance again and the current comes back down again. And then who knows what happens after that. Um, so the idea is if you're going to make a device, step number one is to make something with an IV characteristic that looks a bit like this graph on the right. So uh, people might recognize that as something that has a negative differential resistance. You need something that has a, a strong negative differential resistance somewhere, and then you can operate it somewhere on this negative slope bit uh, and, then, and use that for uh, inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy. That's the, that's the kind of high level idea. Uh, there was a, a PhD student, uh, Aaron Thong, who thought about this came up with a molecule, synthesized it, characterized it uh, in the lab, and also performed a series of calculations. Here I'm going to show the calculations because they more directly address the question we have today. Um, and so the idea is to have a buckyball with a nitrogen. The nitrogen turns out to be crucial, connected to, the, uh, to a benzene ring. And so the benzene ring provides one of the levels, the buckyball provides another one of the levels, and the nitrogen isolates those levels from each other. And then you need to form electrical contacts, so that's done in the usual way with two pieces of gold and uh, a thiol in the case of the benzene and just a uh, sort of a physical contact, I suppose, uh, between the gold and the buckyball in the case of the buckyball. And the, um, the electronic structure is complicated because you've got so many atoms, but you can if you look carefully at the density of states, the function of position is what's showing here at the bottom of the page. You can see one level, which is called the Homo level here, and there's another level which is slightly higher energy, which is the Luma level, and that corresponds roughly to what we have at the top of this figure here. So that's just the that's what we're trying to show there. Okay, so we created a molecule which had that feature, at, at, and then as you vary the voltage and you look at the current, you see you get a current that rises to a maximum drops and then rises again. So that's that's clearly the kind of thing that we want. The only thing you notice is that the voltages here are quite big. And the question is, one volt is, is large on, on our scale. We need volt, voltages of order tenth of volt or something, probably for a sensor. Um, and I think I'm probably almost out of time, which is fine, because I'm just about finished. Um, and the, the the discovery when uh, when we similar to the simulations, you actually find that the, the levels pin. In other words, when these two states come into alignment, and you then continue to change the voltage, they don't unpin, so you continue to get current. So you, you don't have the kind of high level of control that you would like. Uh, if you keep raising the voltage still further, then they eventually they unpin. Um, so that's something to be to be worked on. And so that's it. Uh, I would just like to say that um, on my list of credits here, there's uh, Mung Chuan Lee and Clotilda who are working uh, with me on uh, the extension of, of the computational project to devise a chemical sensor with the desired characteristics. I haven't shown any data yet because I don't think we're ready to show the data, but uh, it is it is work that's ongoing and there is there's stuff happening. And what we're trying to do is build up a set of rules for building these kinds of chemical sensors. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a very intriguing presentation. Uh, can I start with one question and then I'll throw it open to others? So, so uh, regarding the implausibility paper that you, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, just going back to the biological mechanism. So I guess it's it's not too hard to think of excuses. I mean, for example, the modes that were most affected by the hydrogen deuterium substitution would presumably be carbon hydrogen stretches, and those might not might not be amongst the modes that couple most strongly to the charge transport. And I'm sure you I'm sure you could think I'm sure you could think of others. To to what extent have those various avenues been pursued? I, to, what, to what extent do you think this that experimental 
uh, paper is a definitive refutation of the vibrational theory for actual in vivo smell? That's a really good question. The answer is I don't really know because because they're quite complicated experiments and they have to take receptors out of their normal uh, environment and put them into uh, I think their um, kidney cells or something. And it's quite a lot of work was done biologically and you don't quite know what impact there is. There's just many variables. This is the problem. There's so many variables. Uh, it's really hard to know, but I, I, you know, it needs to be taken very seriously. But um, there are also there are also things that you know could have actually led to that outcome, which uh, other than vibration theory being wrong. And so I'm, I feel slightly I'm out of my depth at this point because I'm not a proper biologist, and that's why I've really switched my attention to um, to the nano world where I feel things are easier to understand. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, other questions? Can I ask one? Go for it. Sorry. So I can't, couldn't see who's hand was up, but please just go ahead. Yeah, it's me. Uh, uh, so what is the evidence uh, that there is uh, this uh, electron uh, uh, transfer me mechanism uh, in this possible uh, mechanism of impaction because I've, I've seen, I mean, I've seen this paper, I've also seen other papers uh, where they actually, with the deuterated uh, odorant, uh, they could, uh, for example, make flies uh, go one way or the other, and so there seems to be some, uh, some uh, um, effects. But uh, uh, but this would be just uh, you know the the vibration. Uh, so what is the evidence of the you know this electronic uh, effect? Okay, this is a, another really good question. So that there are two questions there really. So what's the evidence that vibrations are the thing that leads to, to identification, and what evidence is there that electrons are the the me mechanism by which we do the measuring? I don't really know of any mechanism by which the electrons, I mean, Luca is working on this using spin and stuff, but I don't think we have an answer yet. Mm -hmm. We don't have a measurement. I, that's partly why I, I find it easier to go into nanotechnology where you can actually measure currents and, you know, life is much simpler. That's half the answer. The other half is what evidence is there that vibrations are, are key. And there have been various isotope experiments in vivo uh, with humans, with flies, with dogs, with honeybees. Um, and um, there is evidence there that we can detect deuterated molecules. The flies are particularly interesting because you can actually insert another molecule without hydrogen, with just a totally different molecule, which just happens to have a stretch vibration with the same frequency. That's one of the deuterated ones, and it and the flies respond to that as though it being the deuterated. If I remember, I, I think I've got that the right way around. But anyway, there's that, that there's a, a completely independent molecule that leads to the same response from the mm -hmm. flies. So there's bits of evidence, but none of this is is the final word um, because there are always new things that we don't really understand about all of these experiments, I guess. That's what it comes down to. But that should be because, um, I mean, most of these odorants uh, have, uh, you know, are like organic molecules uh, and they're mm -hmm. characterized by very similar frequencies, uh, no? Because they have the mm -hmm. same kind of bonds. Uh. Yes, I mean, the CH, the CC, whatever, you know, they're, they're very, very similar. So, um, yeah, is there any idea of, uh, you know, how do they couple them, how they are different? Because well, the vibration would be very similar. But what's interesting is if you ask an organic, well, actually, I've never done this, so I, this is what I hear, but an organic chemist can, can sort of sniff a, a bottle of something and give you a rough idea of what's in there. Uh, because there are certain groups that have certain odors. Uh, in other words, there are certain, yeah, odor, it can be sort of a, a, attached to a, a functional group, and those functional groups then have a characteristic set of vibrational frequencies. It's not proof again, it's just sort of more anecdotal evidence, but because um, that actually could argue, you could argue in favor of a shape model also on that data, but uh, I'm just saying that there, there is, seem to be these facts that you can kind of assemble. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Carla. Any any other questions? We've got more time, perhaps one more short one before we move on. Either, either put a hand up or I just shout out. No, going, going, gone. 
Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Andrew, for and, and for uh, a really fascinating talk about some of these these these, these really interesting suggestions. And we'll keep our eyes pinned for uh, further data on the uh, on the the uh, uh, artificial implement implementations. Thank you. Great. So uh, our second speaker is Chris Lorenz from Kings, and uh, Chris worked in in several places in the in the states, uh, most recently in Iowa where he was a research fellow at Iowa State and at the Ames National Laboratory before coming to King's uh, in 2007. And uh, he's worked in a lot of different aspects of the simulation of, of solutions, interfacial water and, and, and proteins. But he's going to talk to us today about um, applying these ideas to, to therapeutic delivery via molecular scale simulations. So Chris, over to you. Great, great, thanks. Uh, I suppose you can see that. Yeah, we can, we can see your screen perfectly, Chris. OK, great. Um, all right. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to come give this talk. And thanks for everyone for turning up. Um, yeah, so today I'm just going to talk about some of the latest work going on in my group. Um, one one area of interest in our group is is modeling um, drug delivery vehicles and their interactions with with the environment or with the biological environments. Um, and obviously, for these drug delivery, the whole need for drug delivery vehicles come from the fact that a lot of the drug molecules that um, are used today are poorly soluble in, in, in water and hydrophobic. And so we need something to be able to, to um, solubilize them in, in order for them to be delivered uh, within our bodies. And, and also these nanoparticles or these drug delivery vehicles allow for targeting um, in certain instances as well. And there's all kinds of different um, shapes and formulations that um, that these drug delivery vehicles can take, and we've we've been um, modeling various aspects of these, and the, the ones I show here are just of soft matter. Uh, there are of course other ones based on graphene oxide. People are interested in using graphene oxide, et cetera, for this kind of thing as well. Um, so yeah, so the types of simulations we do in my group are are actually mostly classical. Although they're completely informed by um, information from quantum uh, simulations, and these days more and more so, we're ha we're the simulation um, approaches have now become to the point where we can derive bespoke quantum or bespoke force fields for our classical simulations from um, the density functional theory, uh, and and then turn around and use it straight away. And so I'll highlight a couple instances or areas in these studies where this is particularly useful. And just in case anyone's not familiar with what molecular dynamic simulations are or how they work, the basic idea is that our um, software just, just calculates um, Newton's law of motion over and over again for every um, atom in our system. And so we can, we, we um, solve F equals MA, we integrate it, we get the force from the potential energy, and the potential energy is then um, consistent of intermolecular uh, terms, which are intramolecular terms, which model the, which um, define the conformations that the molecules take in our simulations, and then the intermolecular, which um, define the interactions between the various molecules. And all these constants you see, like the force constants, the equilibrium constants, these are all, um, and the epsilons and sigmas, partial charges, these are all derived from, from density functional theory um, kinds of approaches and then inputted uh, into the um, classical simulations that we use to simulate, simulate study these problems. Um, and then this just gives an idea of how the the a flow chart of how the simulations work. So you start out with the initial coordinates and velocities of your system, calculate the forces using your potential energy, then you solve the equations of motion, update your particles, velocities and positions, and then you just do this until your system reaches um, some kind of steady state so that you can measure the quantities you're interested in. Um, and so there's in our group we're kind of doing looking at four different aspects of of um, these the these kind of therapeutic nanoparticles. Um, and so one of them is just looking at the therapeutics and how they interact with environment. And I should say that in almost every case, um, every one of these different aspects were 
um, reaching out and trying to collaborate with experimental groups um, because we feel that it it provides a lot more depth and breadth to our, our understanding. And so as I go, I'll show two cases where we've done that and hopefully um, show you some interesting results. But when it comes to the therapeutics, this is one place where really um, traditional classical force fields fail because of the complicated um, uh, distribution of charges on these molecules, uh, which results from the chemistry, underlying chemistry of them. But the traditional classical force fields just don't do that great a job of predicting uh, their behavior. And so nowadays, there's it's quite um, common that if people are interested in studying kind of therapeutics like this, they will generate a bespoke force field using uh, DFT uh, to interact with the rest of their the molecules in their system. Um, and so we've been uh, we've just started working on this. So these are a series of drugs that are a varying quality when when it comes to crossing the blood brain barrier. And so we're interested in um, using uh, using simulations in combination with uh, neutron scattering to try to understand um, how the salvation of these changes in different uh, environments as, as they pass. So to try to understand the mechanisms that allow them to pass through the blood brain barrier. Um, and then another thing, another aspect which we've done some work on, which I'm not going to talk about due to time today, but is just the solubilization of therapeutics into the drug delivery vehicles. And so in a recent study, one of my students looked at um, just how if you have two different drugs, so ibuprofen and endomethacin, which are two um, uh, typical NSAIDs, and how they, they, how just having, based on the different uh, um, degree of interaction between the drugs, it can result in, um, with endomethacin, which aggregates a lot on its own, it can actually drive the micelle to split into um, smaller micelles, whereas with ibuprofen, which doesn't kind of interact quite as strongly inside the micelle, it just, the, the surfactants in the micelles in this case just can stay as one stable micelle. Um, and so this was kind of interesting to see that not only is it just the a material that makes up the drug delivery vehicle uh, has an effect on the structure of the micelle or the vehicles that when they're in cat uh, with drugs solubilized in them, but also the chemistry of the drug plays a, ro um, a role in all this. Uh, the two parts I'll talk about a bit more detail um, today are, are so we're really interested in understanding the structural and interfacial properties of the drug delivery vehicle. And I think we've done some pretty cool stuff uh, using machine learning, which I'll talk about in a minute, in order to try to characterize the internal structures of these nanoparticles, um, which then allows you to better understand where drugs might fit in to them. And then also, uh, we're really interested in how various drug delivery vehicles interact with the cell membranes, um, which they would uh, in, um, come into contact with in 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 their biological application, and so we're doing a lot of work trying to model uh, the interaction of of various drug delivery vehicles with different types of lipid membranes as well. Um, and so, just as an example of what we can what we've done with looking at the internal structure of molecules inside of a drug delivery vehicle, is um, we've done a lot of work looking at lipid nanoparticles. And these lipid nanoparticles are made up of um, triglycerides and then are coated with a surfactant. Uh, and uh, they're solid at room temperature. Uh, the first, well, solid lipid nanoparticles are solid at room temperature and they allow drug molecules to be trapped amongst these solid lipids. Um, and we want to just use simulations to try to understand how the structure might impact um, the localization, localization of drugs inside the nanoparticles. And so in this case, specifically, we're, our lipid is this tripalmatin, which is a completely unsaturated triglyceride. And then the surfactant, which coats um, the nanoparticle, is, a, is um, bridge O10. And it has this hydrocarbon chain and then like ethylene oxide um, head group, which uh, is, remains in solution, and then our solvent is just water. 
And these are just snaps, snapshots of the equilibrated lipid nanoparticles, but it was really interesting for us to see that what happened. So the left here is just the triglycerides, and you can see that basically there are crystalline facets that form of these triglycerides, which with the oxygens in the um, in the head group of the triglyceride at the interface with the water and the hydrocarbon tails. Um, uh, of course, being shielded into the core of the nanoparticle. And then the Brigio 10 sits in between these different facets and covers uh, or and shields these hydrocarbon tails, which otherwise would, of course, be somehow exposed to the aqueous environment, um, shields those from contact with water, and then almost completely, but not in, at least in this case, not entirely cover the surface of the um, nanoparticle, but of course these oxygens and the triglycerides are, um, if, I don't mind interacting with water and so therefore it's, it's not so um, outrageous to think that there would be some contact there. Uh, and this just shows that um, these uh, hydrocarbon chains of the bridge O10 um, intercolate with the hydrocarbon tails of the uh, triglycerides and how they kind of fit in in these facets. And so what we wanted to do then is to try to characterize the structure of these triglycerides within the nanoparticle. Um, traditionally in the literature, uh, there, there's a geometric way of that people have used to characterize the shapes of these different molecules based on the angles formed by these three vectors from the central carbon in the head group of the triglyceride to the terminal tail of each of the um, uh, hydrocarbon chains in the triglyceride. And these then come up with colorful names like uh, trident, uh, propeller, tuning fork, and chair, all based on um, the conformations that they take. Um, and these are just the, uh, the definitions in terms of the angles. But so then, um, so we first just use this, when we first started, we just used this geometric classification. We were able to characterize the shape of all these different molecules of all the different triglycerides in our nanoparticle and then we could once we characterize them then we can look at where they're placed um, within the very or as a function of distance from the surface and what we see is that uh, that in the core that there's more of these kind of uh, tuning fork and stuff and then as you get closer to the interface you get more um, trident uh, um, uh, confirmations, which makes sense because the trident have the three arms kind of interject or pointing toward the core of the nanoparticle, and then the um, oxygen head groups kind of accessible to the surface. Uh, then, after we studied these solid um, lipid nanoparticles, um, then we wanted to study the uh, also liquid lipid nanoparticles, which are basically um, the same thing except for that the fact that the triglycerides then have uh, sat unsaturated um, bonds, double bonds in the, the chains, which then cause them to kink and result in the nanoparticle being liquid instead of the, un the fully saturated ones, um, which are able to crystallize inside the core. And we use the same surfactant again. And in this case, uh, I guess we, uh, had become cool enough or something that Demi decided to that she'd like to try to use some um, machine learning to characterize the shape of these molecules instead of this geometric approach. And so we use something that's called self-organizing maps as a dimensionality reduction technique to reduce the high dimension data we have get from our simulations to two-dimensional representation of the data. And then a clustering, k-means clustering to cluster this data into to see if we come up with different um, clusters of confirmations. And in the end, what we find is, in fact, we do, we end up with eight different clusters of, um, eight different clusters of confirmations. And the cool thing that to us was that they all basically are the same confirmations that would be, um, that were being looked for in the uh, geometric approach anyhow. So, um, so you can see that uh, like cluster zero here is propeller, cluster one um, is a trident, 
of some short shape, cluster three is a trident of some shape, cluster six is a trident of some shape, cluster seven. So, we'll, and also the cool thing is we're able to see that um, that even though these are generally like tr all trident, that there's some flexibility in the conformations that are observed um, even with inside these definitions. And we're able to provide a bit clearer description of what these structure, molecular structures are. Um, and so, yeah, and so we're able to do that. We're able to then look and we then look to see within each cluster what the probability or what the we use the geometric um, uh, definitions because we label every molecule in our simulation as being in a given cluster. So then we go back with the geometric uh, rules and calculate the shape that they would have by that definition. And in every case, we see that the majority of the um, species that we find rep are representative of of a, a given conformation. So, uh, and in some cases, they're all one of the geometric definitions. So, so that's um, interesting, and I think nice that is somehow the machine learning and the the um, geometric approach combined to the same result. And then what we're able to do uh, in the end is then uh, basically come up with a description of how, again, just like we were able to before with the geometric approach, we can now then label all the different molecules and cluster them into the different clusters and then describe, come up with, wow, well, this is just a cartoon, but a description of where these different types of molecules are found inside the um, lipid nanoparticle and therefore understand the um, difference in the conformations that are seen from liquid and solid, et cetera. Uh, we've also tried this on an even more complicated um, molecule. So we're also interested in studying, we also study polymeric nanoparticles and we're studying um, what's called a tetronic, which has got four arms um, and there's and they're basically ethylene oxide or propylene oxide and ethylene oxide block copolymers um, on each arm. And uh, what we wanted to, and we wanted to, we were again studying the nanoparticle of these and we wanted to try to understand what the conformations are of these molecules within the nanoparticle. And unfortunately, um, I wasn't smart enough to figure out any cool geometric rules to try to describe um, this molecule. So instead, we just turned to machine learning and another one of my great PhD students, uh, Rob, um, worked on this. He used a different method than Demi had done, but nonetheless, um, we're able again to, it's the basic idea is the same. We do dimensionality reduction. We get a two-dimensional representation of our data. Then we use a clustering algorithm to cluster uh, this data. And then we can, we, we, so then we're able to identify five different clusters of our, of the conformations of these polymers inside our nanoparticle. And we can see that there are some that have uh, um, all the all the arms are kind of very spread out. Some with three arms bunched up and one arm crossing, etc. And so, like the interesting thing is that these two, which are all very compact, are sitting at the interface of the um, core of the nanoparticle, and then kind of the corona of the nanoparticle. Um, whereas one in five are usually in the core of the nanoparticle. So the, the purple part here is the PPO, the polypropylene oxide bit. And those, so that would sit in the hydrophobic core with the hydrophilic PEO arms reaching out to the various sides of the nanoparticle. And then this one is usually found on the core shell interface where the three arms are kind of bunched up together, but then one reaches across uh, to the opposite side of the nanoparticle such that the hydrophilic part, the EO, part can dangle into the aqueous environment on the other side. Um, so I think this is a really cool and powerful tool. And uh, um, we're now using this for conjugated polymeric nanoparticles to, try to understand um, different conformations that those type of polymers take and how that fits into the um, their uh, photophysics, et cetera. Um, and then the last 
thing I want to talk about, I thought it was fitting because it's a really a, a true LCN collaborative project, um, was some work done by a PhD student, Irena, um, who was modeling um, some pseudocapsids that are made from antimicrobial peptides. And this was done with uh, Max Radnov at NPL and Bart Hogenboom at UCL. Um, and these peptides are are uh, triskelion, so they have this this kind of core, and then they have three arms, which are antimicrobial, and they're known to short to form beta sheets, and then self-assemble into nanoparticles. And so what we did is we started by first modeling the simple um, triskelion molecule, and then building up a little patch. And along the way, we realized that these nanoparticles wouldn't be stable just in a monolayer with one layer of proteins that had to be that has to form a, a bilayer and they have to so that the hydrophobic residues of the peptides can interact with one another and not be exposed to water in order to be stable as a nanoparticle so we built up this structure into the ultimate football um, and then we were able to uh, show that these are are stable and that they um that they don't just fall apart when we after we've built them uh and then and then we wanted to study how they interact with with a bacterial membrane so that we could try to understand the mechanisms by which they uh they attack uh bacterial membranes and so um so this just shows the nanoparticle approaching a bacterial membrane and then in this case, because the simulation of um, the peptides, are, the nanoparticles are so stable, we don't actually start to see them disassemble and uh, um, attacking the membrane as you would expect them to do uh, um, in in experimental setting. And so instead, in order for us to look at the um, how they attack these membranes, we just took one of these um, tiles like this and we put that on top of a membrane and here we can see uh the the or orig origination of a pore so here you can start to see a water starting to form across this so this is the origin of a of pore formation which once you start to form pores in these membranes then uh the bacteria is not going to live for very long um and so this was really cool to show how the the proteins in these nanoparticles reach across and start to destroy um, these bacterial membranes. So, so yeah, so um, uh, this, this is my group. Um, these are all the great collaborators that uh, worked on these various projects with us. And uh, these are the um, people who give me money and computation time to, uh, to do these cool projects. So thanks for your for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, shall, shall I kick things off with a quick with a quick question? Uh, th so you mentioned you mentioned that the connection with quantum mechanics is that the potential to kind of follow through from DFT in some places, particularly to capture tr tricky aspects of the bonding. Um, but my impression is that you're probably relying quite heavily on descriptions also of things like hydrogen bonding and van der Waals interactions, which DFT often often struggles with. Do, how do you how do you square all that off? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, all the big simulations I show are done in classical simulations, and those are, I mean, I guess. Uh, so most of the models there have been shown, like for water and these kind of things, and like the uh, proteins and stuff. If you look at the um, the bond distances and at bond angles that are created by within these, and compare them to the hydrogen bond distances within PDBs and everything, you can see really good comparison of the angles and bond lengths and stuff. So these are the kind of ways we rationalize those models against that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I can see Will William, you've got a hand up. So do you want to fire away with a question? Yeah, so I was wondering um, in the last kind of simulation model that you showed, um, you s it seemed that the antimicrobial properties were not functioning um, when they were in a, in essentially a nanoparticle form. And when, when you took a single platelet, essentially, and put it in contact with the membrane, then you saw it actually activate. Um, 
in a nanoparticle form, would you then expect that the peptides are actually just denatured in a different com conformation than is actually uh, useful as an antimicrobial? Uh, I think it's more that it, probably that the time scales it would take for the nanoparticle to um, change, like for the proteins within the nanoparticle to uh, change their conformations in order to attack the membrane because they're quite stable in this nanoparticle form is probably just beyond the scope that we can sample with our molecular dynamics because we can only get to like um, microseconds at best or uh, um, at least that's what we're able to achieve. Some people are able, people with far more money and resources <laughs> than I have are able to achieve hundreds of microseconds, I suppose. But um, but yeah, so I think it's more that than, than the denaturing question. And so if you don't mind a follow up, what do you yeah, think would be the, the mechanism for the nanoparticle actually um, kind of destabilizing? Because if it is uh, cellular contact with the membrane, do you think it's a membrane protein that's going to be responsible or? Um, well, so so the experimentally, they um, they seem to see them kind of almost go. So I didn't show any of the experimental results, but you can you can see them in the the, the journal article, um, but they almost look like uh, they're going through like uh, uh, pellets from like the, they're going through as whole nanoparticles almost. They just seem to be putting holes into the membrane. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? Could I ask one more? I mean, this these sort of, this sort of machine learning classification approaches that you were talking about for for the looking at the, the molecular conformations. I guess they provide a, a potential route through to what you might call a sort of mesoscale model for the behavior for the behavior of these of these things in the sense that you could try and correlate their large distance behavior with not just not just with the microscopic uh, uh, MD, but with the with the conformations, the dynamics of the, co the conformations that the macromolecules are uh, adopting. Um, ha 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 has that been tried and does it work? Um, so is, is your question, Andrew, can you kind of reverse engineer it? Is that the question? I, I guess my question was, can you learn something about the about the fr from your classification about how the system will behave based on the conformations that the molecules adopt in it? Um, so I think so I think it's that yes, I think you can do that. And I don't know that anyone's really done it yet. I think it takes, I mean, obviously, if you want to say something more generally, I think it takes a lot of, you'll have to study lots of um, different chemistries and stuff to try to get there. But I think the one thing I should say you can do, though, straight away is get, you can get, uh, you can understand the dynamics. So you can use this in a way that, like, you can trace the the changes and confirmations if you have something that's time sensitive so we've used this for like trying to look at protein dynamics as well and in that case you can as a protein inserts in a membrane or something you can you can see cluster them along the pathway and you can then learn something about the how the confirmation changes as a result of that so okay thank you yeah thank you thanks any, again. Other, any, any other questions finally for chris I'm not seeing any more hands, so we'll thank Chris very much for that. Right. And so our third and final speaker is uh, Alejandro Alaya Castro, um, our very own AOC. Uh, Alejandra uh, was brought up in, in Colombia and then moved to Oxford for her uh, DPhil in, in 2002. And she came to UCL uh, six years later. She's been in the in the physics department ever since. It, actually, in the in the atomic and molecular uh, physics group, we're very proud to count her as part of our sort of uh, uh, big 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 LCN tent of com uh, community of people who are not formally in the LCN, but who we like we love talking to about things. So we're very grateful for her coming along today. Another thing I should say, uh, just to, to fly the flag, is that she has been an absolutely fantastic vice dean for EDI in the Maps faculty for the last few years. So uh, uh, lots of us are very grateful to her for that. Anyway, she, that's not what she's going to talk about today. Today she's going to talk about her work on uh, associating vibronic processes with um, with uh, energy transport in photosynthetic complexes. Now Alejandro, I know you've been having some problems with your internet connection. You've sent me a copy of your presentation. Do you want to try showing it yourself? Yeah, I'm going to try to share and then okay. hopefully this will. I, I have closed as many things as possible, so <laughs> hopefully the connection will be good enough. We're seeing that perfectly at the moment, Alejandro. Yeah, okay, great. So. I am 
so, so today what I would like to do is to present an overview of the work that we have tried to do uh, in the last 10 years. And when I think of the time, it's like, oh my God, this is flying. But we have tried to understand, in particular, vibronic processes in photosynthetic complexes. So the first part of the talk will focus kind of just to give an overview of why this is an interesting problem. And then in the second part, which will, will be the last 15 minutes, I would like to present some theoretical analysis that we have done uh, that we don't have experiments for those uh, theoretical analysis, but it's a theoretical analysis to motivate new experiments uh, for these systems. OK. So just to start with, if you are not familiar with the problem of interest, this is a video with a cartoon of what we are interested. So this is a cartoon of a light harvesting antenna, which is this complex that you find in photosynthetic systems that have different chromophores. In this case, we're illustrating chlorophylls and they absorb uh, light collectively. And when they absorb this light collectively, they form a collective electronic excitation that we call the exciton. And this excitation, this collective excitation, is passed around, if we can say it like that, or is transferred within each molecule and from each of these molecules to um, a big, a different macromolecule, which is the reaction center where actually the chemistry of photosynthesis starts. And at very low intensities, this process is very efficient. So almost every photon that is absorbed gets transformed into a charge separation event at the reaction center. And from there, then the chemistry starts. So understanding why the efficiency is this high uh, is one of the key problems in this uh, field. Of course, we do have an idea. We have a separation of time scales that uh, mean that the majority of energy is preserved before it is dissipated. But we want to understand the more microscopic details of this. And one particular question is what is truly quantum mechanical and in particular coherent uh, in, in all this process? of these first steps of photosynthesis from where the excitation is absorbed to where it is transferred within each of the light harvesting complexes to the process that transfer from one light harvesting, light harvesting complex to another one and what is truly non-classical in the in, in in this process so by this we mean what is a process that we can describe here that we cannot use any classical analog to describe so this is the problem and the subject of the research, part of the research that we've done in the last 10 years. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what, what we have done in that respect. So my approach, because I am a physicist by training, my approach is complementary to the approach that a physical chemist or a quantum chemist will have. So I try to integrate contemporary quantum science theory because we want to understand truly what is non-classical in the systems. We take an open quantum system approach rather than a molecular level approach for this. And experimentally, our aim is to use quantum optical techniques to prove coherence properties in these systems. And that's where we are aiming at the moment. So let me tell you what people agree. So in this field, what we understand, we share the understanding among the different communities that are interested in this problem in the at the level of one light harvesting complex of one of these macromolecules, there are two different kind of processes. There is an interplay between two opposite processes. And this balance interplay is what guarantees that energy transfer in this system is optimal. And these two processes are collective coherent motions and an interplay with thermalizing, localizing motion. So that comes from the thermal motions of the protein to which these chromophores, which are illustrated here in as these black uh, structures, are attached, but also from the internal motions and nuclei motions of these systems. And the uh, our main objective is to understand to a large level of detail what is that interplay, but also how the function of this molecule will depend of each of these elements. So it is very clear that when it comes to absorption, 
there is a quantum mechanical process is happening here at the electronic level, and is that the electronic degrees of freedom of these different chromophores are now directly interacting in a quantum mechanical form to then um, imply that when life is absorbed, is absorbed by collective electronic excitations that are quantum mechanically delocalized or better quasi localized on different um, parts of the system. And this is something you can see directly in the absorption uh, of these uh, molecules in which is a broad is a broad absorption because of course you have thermal motions there and you have different molecules that have different conformations but overall we know that the molecules absorb light that individually each chromophore will not so that is the characterization of a collective electronic excitation being uh, the responsible for absorbing in this system so and that is something that you can only describe quantum mechanically so there is absolutely no discussion about that Everybody agrees with this. And actually, what we know is that nature has exploited that quantum mechanical feature to actually develop different light harvesting complexes for the different photosynthetic systems to absorb a variety of wavelengths across the whole visible spectrum. So from that perspective, this is quantum mechanics 101. And yes, these systems do depend on this for their function. Now, the bit that is uh, let's say it's still an open discussion is to what extent there are quantum processes that you cannot describe in any other form or without any classical analog when it comes to the energy transfer in these systems. And one of the things that we have understood in the last 15 years is that the interactions between the electronic uh, excitations in this system and the phonon environment that is uh, provided by the protein motions and the nuclei motions of the individual chromophores, even the solvent, those interactions are not trivial. And those interactions, these systems have evolved to have these interactions in a particular way that exhibit certain features. And one of these features is illustrated in the figure here, and it's the following. The blue lines that you see here represent energy difference between the different collective electronic states of this system. So there's, these are the energy gaps in the excited state with a single excitation. And if you compare these energy gaps with what we call the spectral density, which is essentially how strongly these electronic excitations are coupled to these phonon bats associated to each of these chromophores, what we observe is that there seem to be some quasi resonance between these energy gaps that you have in your electronic uh, in the excited states of uh, of your electronic system and some specific vibrational motions that might breach those energy gaps because there is a quasi resonance uh, in, in, in the energy scales that they have. And this particularity means that there are some specific interactions that might not behave in the incoherent form that we normally were associating to the interactions between phonon and uh, electronic excitations in these systems. So this quasi resonance is one of the problems that people have investigated in the last 10 years trying to understand what are the implications of this now putting a name to these vibronic interactions. Um, in the function of these molecules, and that has been one of the questions that we have addressed. Now, there is a still an ongoing discussion about it because experimentally uh, it has evolved the way we these these uh, different processes are probed in these systems. But there is still not. Uh, I would not say that there is a full agreement in the interpretation of all of these results. Uh, but there is an agreement in the fact that there are important electronic vibration or better exciton vibration interactions in these systems that are being responsible for what is observed in the experiment, but also for the function of the systems. In particular, last year, there is a very nice work by Greg Engel, in which is showing specifically how these interactions determine the energy transfer to specific sites, but also how the same interactions are responsible or not for the presence of coherence patterns in the experiments that they develop. So all of this to give you an idea that these vibronic interactions are key for these uh, photosynthetic complexes. So one of the focus that we have done is then we would like to understand specifically 
if you have these vibronic interactions in these systems, what does it mean for different aspects of the physics of these light harvesting complexes? So one of the problems that we have, the way we have addressed this problem is that if you have these exciton vibration interactions in these systems with this quasi resonance process, which means that you have vibrations with energy quanta that bridge exactly the energy gap, or not exactly, but bridge more or less the energy gap between different electronic degrees of freedom in your system, in the excited state, then we would like to understand how these interactions will manifest and will affect the physics of the electronic degrees of freedom, but also how it will affect the physics of the vibrational degrees of freedom. And from that perspective, then, uh, we have developed different works in that direction. We have shown in agreement with what has now been experimentally demonstrated that if you have this quasi resonance in the system, then it means that your energy transfer has a particular directionality, not just efficiency and precision, but it has directionality. So energy transfer is uh, from, from a particular, targeted to particular sites, just as the work of Engel is demonstrating experimentally in, uh, last year. We have also shown how this interplay between electronic and vibrational degrees of freedom depend very strongly on how the localized these electronic excitations are. The more the localized they are, the um, easier, if, uh, no, not easy, but the more the wider is the possibility of the frequencies that can affect this transfer wire if these excitons are quite localized, that quasi-resonance is even more critical. We have demonstrated that if we focus our attention of the degrees of freedom that are associated to those specific vibrations that bridge, bridge this energy gap, and you focus on the quantum properties of this, in particular looking at the fluctuations in the occupation numbers of those vibrations, then we have demonstrated that the occupation of the, the that, that these um, fluctuations are not something that you can describe by any classical mechanism, which is telling us that truly non-quantum phenomena are associated precisely to those electronic vibrational interactions in the system. That, and this brings me to the final, to, to the final, our most recent work, which is what I would like to focus in the next um, 10 minutes that I have for, of, of this talk, and is focusing now on the observables of those vibrations and and, and the physics of those vibrations in interaction with those electronic degrees of freedom, we have then in, tried to investigate how these vibrations of different chromophores might be synchronized or antisynchronized. In general, what is the dynamic of that synchronization and what that tells us about the interplay between coherence and decoherence. So, the specific question, the specific uh, research question that we have asked uh, in relation to the possible synchronizations of vibrational motions during energy transfer is how quantum coherence will affect this, what we call a spontaneous synchronization. It's called spontaneous synchronization because it's not that we are driving the system to synchronize, but simply that the system absorbs energy, then we let the system evolve in time, and then we see what happens with that, uh, with the, post the correlations between the motions of the vibrations of different chromophores that are undergoing this energy transfer. And the specific vibrations that we focus here are those ones who, who bridge the energy gaps, no who, which bridge the energy gap be between the uh, energy levels in the excited state of these molecules. Now, our interest in in synchronization is because synchronization is widely uh, expressed in nature. And it is also of interest in other aspects of uh, the physics research. So we saw in synchronization uh, a niche for understanding not just what might be going across different scales in nature and now at the molecular scale, but also a bridge with other aspects that have been uh, that are being investigated in quantum technologies. So just to remind you what synchronization is about, this is um, a video that I took in California uh, of two uh, timers synchronizing. And these are not interacting directly. 
uh, strongly, but because they are in the same base, they interact weakly. And this is what is responsible for the fact that after some time, these two uh, timers start synchronizing. So similarly, in the system that I'm considering as a prototype, I only had two chromophores that are interacting via dipole-dipole interaction. And in the excited states of each of these chromophores, uh, is interacting with a particular vibrational motion. In this case, it's an intramolecular motion with energy that bridges the gap between the uh, energies between the two chromophores. And I am interested in understanding how these vibrations are synchronized or not. What is the dynamics of synchronization of these vibrations? And how what this tells me about the interplay between coherence and decoherence in this system. We use as a measure of synchronization this Pearson coefficient factor, which essentially tells me if these systems are synchronized, what is the phase difference between them? So it gives me a value only when the systems are synchronized, but the value that it gives me tells me about the phase lag. Uh, between the two systems that are synchronized. So this is important to understand now what these results are telling us. So we consider, as I mentioned, these two chromophores and the results that I'm about to present for those who might be familiar are just in the simplest form of open quantum system approach. But don't be misled uh, by the fact that even this simple approach already gives us good insight of what happens when you consider a more sophisticated and no perturbative approach to the interaction between your electronic degrees of freedom and your phonon environment here. But I'm presenting these simple ones because they already give us a pretty good insight of the interplay between coherence and decoherence and what this has to do with the synchronizations of those vibrations and why this is interesting for these systems. So our model assumes that we have weak coupling interaction between our system and our environment. And our problem of interest is understanding the synchronization between the displacements, X1 and X2, of the vibrations associated to the excited states of these chromophores that are interacting via dipole-dipole interaction. So to understand what synchronization requires for it to happen, the first thing that we did is Imagine that we have no decoherence processes in the system, so you only have coherent interactions between electronic degrees of freedom here and those vibrations in the excited state. And we're interested in understanding that correlation between the displacements of the two vibrations. We start the system in an initial state in which this is excited in an exciton state, not just in a localized state in one of the particular uh, chromophores, but is in an state that is a collective uh, electronic states of the two systems. Therefore, any dynamics that comes here comes from the interaction with those vibrations. But we assume that we only have coherent interactions between these vibrations, and then we measure that correlation that tells us about the synchronization between the two vibrations. That measure is this red curve that you can observe here, and this is as a function of time. What these results are telling us is that the systems do not synchronize, because at every point in time, that phase lag between the oscillations of the displacement is changing. So the main message that these results are telling us is that when you have coherent interactions between these electronic degrees of freedom and these vibrations that are not directly interacting, but they get correlated through the interactions between the electronic degrees of freedom or of the chromophores, you will not have synchronization. So at no point, these two vibrations will synchronize. And this is important. Why? Because when you introduce the coherence in this system, which is natural in these systems, then you see that the dynamics of synchronization is very different. So you see that your system evolves towards a transient state in which those vibrations are anti-synchronized, and then eventually in time they become synchronized. And for this synchronization to actually happen, then you need to have coherence and decoherence. So let me just stop for a second there and give the main message that I want to say here. One of the problems that, one of the objectives that we had is that we wanted to understand what is the process in these systems that does require that it is necessary for it to have the two components, a coherent component and a decoherent component for it to happen. 
And one of the processes that we, we came up with an answer for that is precisely desynchronization. So this is important. Why? Of course, energy transfer is, 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 is which is the fundamental function of these molecules, is necessary for it, for it to happen. You need the two. But energy transfer could, could happen also just with the coherent mechanisms. But synchronization is one that requires the two. It requires a coherent process so that in these systems, so that you have these phase differences, but it requires a decohering process that stabilizes those phases between those displacements. So this was something interesting for us because it was possible for us to show that this synchronization process is one that requires of these two elements for it to happen. And also that the dynamics of this synchronization is telling us a lot about what is happening with the energy transfer, which leads me to the next results. So let me bring you back to these results here, which are showing the correlation between the displacements of one vibration and the other vibration as a function of time. And this is telling me that as it goes in time, the system goes to an anti-synchronized state for those vibrations, and then eventually it synchronizes. What I would like to discuss now is what this anti-synchronized and this synchronized tell us about the energy transfer and why does this happen? So the first thing is that to have any phase differences between the displacements of these vibrations, those phase difference come because we have coherent evolution in the system. So you have a quantum mechanical interaction between electron degrees of freedom and vibration, which means that at the beginning of your system, your system is not an, in an eigenstate of your system, and therefore, therefore it will evolve into a superposition, which represents, which is associated to these different frequencies that you observe in the displacements. But then, as the coherence start kicking off in these systems, then these displacements, some coherences die faster than other ones, and as the system evolves towards a thermalized state in a basis that is in the joint exciton vibration interactions, then your vibrations will synchronize. And this is what we observe here. So in these figures, we have compared both energy transfer from one exciton state to another exciton state, which is represented by the blue curve. And at the same time, the dynamics of synchronization of the vibrations. These two systems share the fact that the energy gap is exactly the same, and therefore the vibrations that are in resonance with the energy gap have the same energy. But the main difference between these two is the degree of the localization of the excitons uh, in your system. So the uh, electronic coupling in one case is smaller than the other one. And this is, imp this is important because this determines in in effect, the dynamics of energy transfer in your system. So we see that in one case, these dynamics, in both cases that we have considered here, you have a non-exponential grow of the transfer from one exciton to another exciton. But in one case, you have an oscillatory behavior that is telling you you have a, coherent, a, a predominantly coherent behavior in the energy transfer, while in the first case, in the upper case, eventually that uh, that coherence disappeared really fast. What is interesting is that in, 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 in both cases, the system evolves towards an anti-synchronized um, uh, vibrations, but in one case, uh, it reaches like the maximum anti-synchronization that it could have. So if it, it, that would be if this goes to minus one, while as the system is more coherent in the transfer, that anti-synchronized motion is only visited briefly, but not fully. And why is this important? Because this is telling us about the coherent processes that are being at play in one or the other case. And this is what we confirm in the figures that you observe on the right. What you are observing here are different coherences. And by coherences, mean I mean here, elements that tell me about superpositions of states in your system as the energy transfer is happening. Mathematically, what this means is the off-diagonal elements of your density matrix in the natural basis of the system so that will be the vibronic basis of your system. And what this is telling me is that there are some coherences that are dying faster than other ones, but as time goes, there is one particular coherence that coherence that grows and that dominates, and that's and the growth that coherence determines the time at which 
you reach the synchronization state. So the main message of this figure is that there is a very nice relationship between synchronization and the dynamics of the coherence in your system, and that you need the two phenomena, coherence and decoherence, for that spontaneous synchronization to emerge. How am I doing with time? Now, this is not just a, a theoretical analysis uh, that is an interesting or is a nice curiosity, but actually it starts then helping us make sense of some of the results of the earlier results of the dynamics um, of energy transfer in these systems. For instance, in, this is um, these are experimental results that I think in this case corresponds to one particular complex that is PC645. Uh, which is the one is, is the complex that has inspired our analysis in this case. And the experimental results were showing that if you focus in the off diagonal of this 2D map, uh, you will see that some of the peaks actually oscillate in an asymmetric way, so in an anti synchronized uh, way. And actually, this was uh, speculated at the time as anti synchronized motions affecting the exit on dynamics. Well, that's precisely what we are showing when we demonstrate this transient, when we investigate this transient synchronizations and its dynamics. And in shorter times, we see that we have anti synchronized motions, but that the level of anti synchronization will depend on how strongly these um, chromophores are interacting. The more they are interacting, the less likely is to observe this anti-synchronized motion because it happens in a very, very short time scale. So that also explains why previous results, when you have very delocalized excitons, this anti-synchronization wasn't so evident there, but that when you have quasi-localized excitons, you might observe them better. Now, more as a curiosity ra rather than for relevance in these systems, but more towards how you can control the synchronization processes in these systems and then more towards thinking of artificial systems when we can do that. Uh, we have also investigated what happens when you play around with the different decoherent processes that you have in, in your system. So in this case, the two key the coherent processes that we had in place was the electronic defacing, but also the thermal relaxation of the vibrations that are involved. And when you have that the your electronic defacing, uh, your thermal relaxation happens in a longer time scale in comparison to the electronic defacing, that, which is characteristics of these molecules, that's where you see a dynamics of synchronization, as I have explained. But if we had a situation in which the thermal relaxation was a lot faster than the electronic defacing, then you will see there that the process will be the opposite, and is that those vibrations will tend towards a longer time scale uh, longer stay, uh, sorry, toward, towards a state in the long time regime, long time is picoseconds, so before the excitation is actually di fully dissipated, that is anti synchronized. So essentially, synchronization processes, and better said here, quantum synchronization processes are a, a, a play um, a space for really bringing about a re really very different interplays between coherence and decoherence and therefore selecting different collective motions of your system because that's essentially what synchronization is about a collective behavior depending on that interplay so this was for us particularly interesting because then we are now considering experimental settings when where this can be achieved this is not interesting for now but if, 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 because I'm just about to finish, um, if in the questions I can talk a little bit more about many other uh, quantum aspects that are associated to this quantum synchronization. But just to finish, this is the work that was done by a former PhD student, Stefan uh, Shivia Jacek, uh, in collaboration with another PhD student, some of those aspects, uh, Tao Li. And form and more work in that direction we are developing now together with a postdoc that is Charlie Nation and we are funded uh, thankfully by the PSRC and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed Alejandra. And um, thank you to the internet that didn't break down. <laughs>
Yeah, you were, you, were, you were perfect. You were perfectly audible and perfectly visible throughout. So that's that's absolutely great. Um, can I ask a quick question about the origins of the synchronization? So as, as I understand it, I mean, certainly in the case of the, of the, of the metronomes you showed, right, there's, there's no quantum mechanics there. So that's, that's a nonlinear classical coupling, I guess. Exactly. And is, is, is it obvious that the sort of indirect coupling via the electronic levels in this case is always going to outweigh the nonlinear couplings that you might get for other reasons, for example, because of anharmonicities in the, in the vibrational spectrum? It is. At, I would say, I don't know if it is obvious, but it's not definitely a feature that people have focused on. Mm -hmm. And in particular, because the synchronization will depend strongly, the process of the, the, of the synchronization will depend strongly of the level of electronic interactions that you have in your system. So if you have very strong interactions, that anti-synchronized motion is just simply not visited at all. While if you have very weak electronic interactions, it will. So it is not a process. It is not a, an approach that people have taken in, into investigating these systems. Obviously, because the majority of the experiments are towards electronic, uh, proving the electronic degrees of freedom rather than the vibrations. So, in short, I don't know if it is obvious. It wasn't obvious for us. It was, but it was interesting to understand that indeed, it is concomitant with the energy transfer that these processes are happening there. OK, thank you. Any any other questions? Do you should either put a hand up or shout out? I'm not seeing any. We are almost out of time. Um, but if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to invite everyone to 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 unmute and uh, give a round of applause to thank all three all three speakers because that was that was a that was a really interesting symposium. I think particularly the the, the different uh, the different uh, uh, different effects of uh, of the resonances between electronic and vibrational states in different contexts some things that we could that we could learn a lot from. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>